First, uh, Lance, I want to say thank you, and I want to say thank you to all of you who are viewing. Thank you to Teaching Matters for centering this work and the way that you are centering it and caring about teachers uh, to curate uh, the webinars, to curate the lesson plans and all of the work that you have been doing, that you are doing, and that you will continue to do, not just in this moment in history, but what you have been doing. Uh, and with that, I want to say that racial literacy, just historically, was a concept that was first created, or we first see it in the literature, uh, from Frances Wendance Twine. And she is a, a sociologist, a feminist thinker and writer. And um, she was working with uh, women, for the most part in the United Kingdom, white women, uh, mostly Irish and British, who were married to Black men and had these beautiful biracial children. Uh, the women, however, were recognizing how their children were being treated differently than other children. And so as parents often kind of start talking and chatting and gathering, they became this collective group talking about their experiences and somehow uh, became familiar with uh, Frances Wendance Twine, gathered them together to talk about their experiences. And out came this term, this notion of racial literacy, having this type of uh, mechanism, uh, in this case, discourse, to talk about what they were experiencing as parents of biracial children and trying to understand what their children were experiencing. So it is certainly, and that was 2003. That's the first time we see it. Then we see it in 2004 with Lonnie Guineer. I call her the OG of racial literacy. She's in critical legal studies and she writes this phenomenal piece, uh, really looking deeply at the Brown versus Board of Education 1954 decision. And it's called From Racial Liberalism to Racial Literacy. And that's worth the read. Uh, it is an ideology in our field of teacher education, of, of literacy uh, per se, literacy, critical literacies, that is um, taking up this idea that racial literacy is a skill. So I personally define it as a skill in practice in which individuals are able to probe the existence of racism, to examine the effects of race and institutionalized systems on their experiences in US society. And certainly we know that racism is a global pandemic, but just specifically, I'm, I live in the US and so I take that up in US classrooms. So as it's applied to teaching and learning, it's an opportunity for teachers and students to really identify um, themselves. It's an identity mapping and to have a, a deeper understanding of why certain identity markers specifically related to race, although we also care about gender, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, religion, but in this case, how their marker as race opens them up to being treated a certain way. Mm -hmm. And since I'm an English teacher by trade, uh, I engage this with my high school students. I still teach in a high school at times and my teachers at Teachers College to use a multimodal way of doing this. Journaling, collaging, podcasting, spoken word, mm -hmm. songwriting, to track their racial literacy knowledge. So I know that's a long definition, but it's a very deep history. Uh, at another time, you know, or perhaps I can offer resources. Of, I'm thinking of Rebecca Mosley's work, um, Rebecca um, and Melissa Mosley, and I forget Rebecca's, like Rebecca Rogers. They um, look at the racial literacy of second graders. Mm -hmm. So when the kids are not too young, we can start this very, very early, all the way up to adulthood. Critical love is the foundation. And I want to say that because um, I don't want to necessarily present this model as sequentially, right? Like you have to love first, well, actually you do, but that you have to um, have humility before you gain reflection or historical literacy. I'm very much aware that folks may be engaging in their critical humility and reflecting while they're gaining historical literacy. They may also be uh, interrupting and certainly deeply engaged in this deep excavation, right, of where these issues live within them. So I understand that it can be simultaneous. It depends on where people are in their journey. However, what does not shift for me is the foundation of critical love. Mm -hmm. 
this must be this profound ethical commitment to caring for the communities in which we work and serve, and a love, I want to say, that is tied to liberation. The liberation of teachers, the liberation of students as well. So what do I mean by the liberation of, of teachers? You know, we think we're free. Uh, as human beings, we think we're free, right? Particularly saying we're living in a democracy. I'm talking here very specifically about how we can be held in bondage by the stereotypes that we hold uh, about children and about their communities. And those stereotypes, those biases, that's the deep work that we're doing to excavate, really do impact our curriculum, how we see children. So we're not fully free. We're not fully free to see the beauty of the individuals you know, in front of us. Or as my, my dear friend Goldie Muhammad would say, uh, the, the genius, right? Let's cultivate our own genius so that we can then walk into spaces and cultivate the genius of the children in front of us. And so for me, there has to be this deep desire to get free and to break free from that. And also, in addition, as well, right, help our students get free. Give them the language. De help develop that language for them to get free from the stereotypes that are written about themselves and their communities. So uh, very simply, this is a critical love, the way that I'm theorizing it, that's connected to freedom and liberation in the classroom and beyond.